you've got Orleans, Somes Bar, and Butler Flat. Butler Flat right there in the middle. How many people live at Butler Flat, Will? Well, in the summertime, maybe 35, and in the wintertime, about 10. I noticed you got a big fire right out the back door, Will. Yeah, it's been it's been an interesting fire season. Uh, I've, I've never, um, you know, these wet years, uh, the fire does so much better work. It's just kind of chewed through the fuels of the previous 2006 Selms fire that really fits that same footprint. And, uh, and, you know, we've, we've, uh, it was interesting in 2006, uh, I, there was a, a, a rainstorm right after the fire had crowned out over Soames Mountain and slopped all the way down to Butler Creek. And my friend Todd Sother and I uh, walked up uh, Butler Creek uh, right after the rain and the fire had slopped over in a few places. And we took the garbage bags we were throwing, we we're using as dry bags for our clothes and we put out those fires and I went back into fire camp and I went to the IC and I was like, hey, we can hold this on Butler Creek. And he said, you're crazy. I'm not putting my firefighters in there. And if you go in there, I'm going to arrest you. And so I didn't say anything else. I went out and and rounded up these four wonderfully crazy native friends of mine, and including Hawk, who's my neighbor across the creek. And we went up and we held the fire for four days or uh, for four lower four miles of, of Butler Creek uh, until the Plumas Hotshots um keyed it in from the top off Orleans Mountain. So the creek held that time, but it did cross in about 10 or 15 places. And the interesting thing this year is with really no intervention, the perch fire stopped on Butler Creek, um, you know, cold the, the whole way down, which, which was really telling of what we've seen across the board on these fires is that creeks that have never held fires before we're holding fires very effectively. All right, so we're looking at Butler here. <clears throat> so this is a section where you guys are talking about where you held the fire in 2006. Yeah. And then did this whole area burn again in like 2014 or something? That was the 2013 Butler fire. That was that arson start that, that happened uh, down off a trip point a little bit out of the screen on the lower left. And um, yeah, it was a it was a drought year we were in the the dry period you can see the uh, snag patches that were created in that fire and you know in 2013 there was an interesting story where the the fire came down to butler creek from the other side and we were hoping that it crossed because you know seven years after the 2006 Solmes fire getting fire into that uh, recent fire footprint was what we needed to maintain it and Uh, did that happen uh, yes, there was a small finger of fire that crossed and went up to the ridge and they ended up trying to fire out that line from Butler flat all the way up to Soames mountain and then over to Orleans mountain on that North edge of the Butler drainage. But it, uh, it was so moist by that time that they had to throw a ton of fuel at it. And it was a, it was a dirty burn. I think, uh, I think we got Ryan's, uh, Ryan's layers here for that. Uh, here's what you're talking about. That green is where they tried to burn it out. Yep. Got it. Yeah. You, okay. you see where the finger came up to the ridge and they, they did a burnout above it to hold it in. Okay. All right. Well, so you were part of the firing operations here on Perch that brought fire down Antenna Ridge from the top. So at, at that time, the fire was established out here above Perch Creek, uh, Perch community in the bottom can you talk a little bit about how you guys brought down the fire through here and kind of what the political process was like how did that unfold as far as the plan getting made and how did the plan change as you went through it you know in the kind of week leading up to that operation yeah i i think there was pretty broad agreement about that strategy that was the ridge system that was used in 2006 for, uh, to keep the fire out of Orleans. We were so lucky to have Anna Wright, who we've, who's works with the Shasta Trinity National Forest now as our division, Juliet, 
uh, for that burn operation. And, and she quarterbacked uh, the hotshot crews and the hand crews and uh, really coordinated well with, with the, the community, the tribe, um, to make sure, you know, we did good by the legacy hardwoods on that line and to discourage the use, the, the needless use of retardant. You know, in 2006, they bombed the headwaters of Perch Creek, which is the drinking watershed for Orleans with all the super, you know, tons of super tanker drops. And all that phosphorus was showing up in our drinking water at elevated levels for over six years after that fire. So, you know, we're really stoked to have an operations person that cared enough to say, hey, you know, we're going to use the super scooper planes instead of the Borate bombers if we need to hold that ridge between Boise. Um, you know, it was interesting, uh, you know, El Carrizo hotshots did the top part of the firing from up there by the Orleans Mountain Lookout. You know, that you can see the patches up there that really never burned. There's that whole belly on that north side face. You can So you can see where their fire slopped off the ridge. Um, they had to work to get that depth with the the very pistols and the and the firing devices, but but that north facing slope without any um, intrusion didn't burn. So coming, yeah, it was I think interesting. that's I think that's a really yeah, interesting ahead. thing about this year is just that oftentimes you have to work hard to get these firing operations to even move off the line. Yeah, and then but the you know what I learned about hotshot crews is they kind of go at this pretty rapid pace when they're moving along lines and and understandably so, you know, often time is of the essence. But, you know, unlike when we're burning during treks when they change slope and aspect and come onto a a south east face, they they don't slow down and so there was a couple points on that line where it's like all of a sudden, you know, it was it was pretty high intensity fire and and, uh, you know, the holding boss, who happens to be a local fella, had to put the brakes on to keep it on the right side of the line. So that seems like it's definitely a success story, just that you've got. Um, yeah. That you managed to pretty much this whole fire has not yet impacted any structures, eh? Well, you told me that an outbuilding burned uh, night before last or last night. Is that the first building last. that's burned on this whole this whole fire? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so what's it. going on? So, um, yeah, so this area here above the Perch Creek community has been cold now for pretty much since it rained. So you guys kind of snuck this in right before it rained uh, around the first of the month, right? Yeah. I remember I was, you know, corresponding with you, and I was, I was worried because there was – North winds forecast on the front of that, and it seemed seemed kind of uh, well from afar. I don't I don't see what's happening. You know, I just see the weather forecast, and I see my stupid models that are like, "Oh my God, the fire's going to run five miles." And you guys are in it. You're on the ground. You see what's happening. You've got a better read on it. And I was I had my fingers crossed for you guys that nothing, no big dry winds would come while you guys were lighting that. What was the kind of vibe there with? you know, the forecast versus what you're seeing on the ground and making the call to keep lighting. Yeah, well, we we had some great folks, the uh, Diamond Mountain Hot Shots, your friend Dan Dobbins, the soup on that did did kind of took it from that that next leg after uh, Santa Barbara and, and some of us local folks took it from Antenna Ridge, you know, part way down. They they took it most of the way down. Uh that uh, western flank and then handed it off to Lassen at the end. But I think the reality was that the, the weather we were seeing, the weather forecasts were not lining up with on the ground conditions. The, the winds and the gusts were way higher than what we were seeing on the ground. The humidities were lower. Mm -hmm. So that seems like it's been kind of a pattern through this whole event. Yeah. Which I think um, it's interesting to think about that in the context of when we're getting shut down on trexes uh, by people who are hundreds of miles away saying, Oh, it's too dry. It's too windy. You guys are, you know, you're not gonna be able to hold it. And we're down in the bottom of the Canyon and can't even get stuff to light in the shade. Cause it's like <laughs> sopping wet under the, like the first quarter inch of leaves. 
Yeah, so many times on this fire, I realized that we would be out of prescription for a prescribed burn due to too high of humidity uh, and too low of temperature. Right. Uh, well, which you, know, and you really see that on some of these firing operations they've done where it just goes out as soon as they move on and aren't putting pouring the diesel on the ground or dropping the ping pong balls. The fire just has gone out without any help. Yeah. All right. Well, so let's talk a little about just kind of current conditions here on Perch. Um, I'm going to flick through a couple of photos you shot. Um, was it last night or the night before? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, it was just, uh, I went up the Camp 3 road that, that comes off Salmon River. This is um, looking at that main ridge that, that comes down from Soames Mountain all the way to the mouth of the Salmon River. Okay. So this and is last so, night. Yeah, okay. um, they've been, you know, after kind of holding off on implementing the perch firing plan, strategic firing plan that the last team, the Rocky Mountain team had put together, wonderful man named Brad, Brad Petuska. Um, you know, they, the, the recent team kind of sat on that for about a week through the inversion and then through the winds. And then I guess it was two days ago now, they pretty much painted a lot of those ridges with with the helicopter and then yeah that that's pretty much what you see in your last ir is is um you okay. know those and then, lines that, and this is the firing plan with they got orange lines here for where they were planning to ping pong yeah and and then they followed up with drone work and so that first picture you showed was it's kind of, uh, you know, down that ridge, you can see it on this map. It's in green. It's not necessarily on the, the firing plan. Yeah. But um, on the prefrontal winds, <clears throat> the the little balls that come out of the drone were, were blowing 500 feet off the ridge and hitting hitting way down slope. And, and what they call uh, that term ball drift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, unfortunately... It's, you know, there's someone's water line down slope of that. And, and if those uh, balls would have hit on the ridge, it probably wouldn't have reached their, their water system before the rains came. Mm -hmm. But those things are hard to predict. Yeah. And we've seen that on projects we worked on. We worked on a, um, a fire history project in Whiskey Town where there was this patch of old growth that got nuked in a prescribed fire in Whiskey Town in the probably in the late 90s because they it was really super steep drainage with kind of decomposed granite and not much undergrowth and the ping pong balls rolled way downhill before they ignited so they dropped them and they, they just bounced and rolled down this like steep kind of dg gully like a good you know eight or nine hundred feet and then we had head fire through the stand instead of backing fire so it killed a lot of old growth um which was not a good deal, but the good deal was that we had a bunch of old growth that we went out and we fell and we got these like five foot diameter slices off the stumps to count fire, fire scars. Yeah. I mean, you know, last, it was really the night before last that we kind of had a scare and, and I, you know, on the ground, I was thinking that, um, you know, the fire starts that we saw at $3 bar and and uh you know just up river there um by steinecker were arson and it wasn't until i looked at your show the next morning and saw that run that the fire had made um you know out of the klamath river canyon in out that here. direction yeah that that i and saw the spotting that was occurring you know because we hadn't seen hardly any long-range spotting in this fire at all so but there's a receptive dry fuel bed in that meadow. Um, yeah, so, and so this is the night before last, I, I got a call around 1030 from the landowner who was seeing the fire approach their house on their door cam. They were two hours drive away on the coast. Um, so I grabbed the task force that was here at Butler with the couple night division engines and we went down to Oak Bottom and waited across the river and sure enough, you know, the fire was, as you can see, getting really close to the structures. It had burned one of the outbuildings. Uh, and and we were, you know, by like three in the morning, we we're able to, 
you know, grabbed the fire's edge and tied it into the river bar there. But yeah, it's, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's easy to play armchair quarterback. Um, I get it why the teams aren't putting resources out there at night, you know, cause, um, they're trying to conserve, but, uh, we, we have had a couple close calls on this fire where, uh, you know, all, all the team members go home. We have this amazing, you know, 1200, 1400 firefighters in camp, but then the real action happens right at the end of shift when, when they head to camp and, you know, before the night division resources show up or in, in that case of Oak, Oak bottom, they had seen that fire burning over there for the past hour, but night division, uh, the engines didn't know there were homes there. And so they thought it was just a natural fire progression coming down the river and nothing to worry about. So I think that's a lot of what we see is that, you know, this critical information gets lost in translation between shifts, um, and between teams. Uh, so, uh, it's just, I mean, it really highlights the need for us to maintain our local operational capabilities, you know, to integrate, to feed that information to the team so that people are in the right place at the right time. And what's, you know, what you heard me griping about on uh, Salmon River and Orleans complexities a little bit was, you know, the previous three teams, the operations folks were very receptive to local input, especially local, you know, fire personnel input. And, and there was a lot of trust built in that process. And, this last team, you know, Eastern region, maybe it's a cultural thing. You know, a lot of the, the main ops folks are, are um, kind of old school suppression firefighters. And they've, they just, uh, you know, really haven't been listening to local intel uh, very much at all. And, and it's kind of, it's, it's a bummer because it has increased risk. It, you know, four, four or five days before we had that high severity at Butler that slopped over behind the houses on the white side of the Creek. I had told the branch director that I was concerned about that. And he kind of patted my head and said, no, now look at what the fire is doing. And I said, yeah, we're in an inversion. As soon as the inversion lifts, when it hits that South face, it's going to go up. Yeah. And that, that's actually, it was lower down in down. that, in that drainage to the left of there down in here. Um, where it, it, you know, spotted over the hill right behind the structures as everybody, right after everybody had left. Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it's hard when you live with these landscapes your whole life and, and you see fire move across them. And then people come in who have the control over how fire comes to your place and and all and if they don't want to listen to you they don't have to they can you know, they you know they they take it or leave it and so it's 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 been a little bit of a difficult transition with this latest yeah so what are you on your fourth team now yeah we've talked about that a lot on here just about the difficulty in team transition we've also talked a little bit about what you guys have been going on there with your community liaison program and um, just the, you've made a lot of work over the last, you know, 15 years, you know, since 2018, basically <clears throat> to, um, oh, 2008, right. Um, to try to close some of those gaps. So I'm going to jump out here. Um, we look at the mosquito. If I had a little more time, I'd prepare like a little kind of progression here. Cause this is now one big fire, right. But started off as mosquito bluff. And up here, the blue and Marlow, blue two and Marlow, and the and the copper fire that started over in Copper Creek. Yeah, oh, that's right. Which hasn't really <clears throat> hasn't really. It's been active, but it hasn't really spread as far down slope as I thought it might. But let's just talk right now about this firing that's going on in um, what's this drainage? Uh, that looks like Bluff Creek. All right, so we had Mosquito down here, and we watched for weeks as they kind of coaxed it along and kept it tied into these roads. And we saw this firing plan um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, is when this sh first showed up on the MAPS website. And I didn't know if they'd really get to all of it. 
you know, just with the, the weather and watching the rain come in. And then, uh, so what, night before last, they kind of went for it. Or I guess day before yesterday, they uh, they went and hit all these orange lines that were in their plan. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Before then, they were kind of technology limited. They had resource orders in for a bunch of drones because there was air quality issues and they couldn't get the helicopter up. Mm-hmm. So up up until a few days ago they'd only fired about five or ten percent of that strategic firing plan yeah but when the air cleared uh they were able to get a helicopter and and get in there right well it seems like that that kind of isn't a coincidence right like they've been looking at air quality and i think that um my impression is that they've been holding off on a lot of this acreage because we were smoking out the bay area monterey county north bay and that they really didn't pull the trigger on us until we had the atmospheric conditions to really pump all that smoke out to like Eastern Oregon and uh, Northern Nevada and places where we're not really impacting a lot of people. Is that your impression that the smoke management has been kind of a key part of how they've sequenced this? Yeah. I mean, there was definitely negative feedback. There was, I mean, we've had some, even without um, a lot of firing, there was horrific smoke uh, and air quality. You know, it's been, over 1400 here on the instantaneous readings at Butler for several days and Orleans was pretty bad as well. So yeah, I think, you know, the interesting thing talking with the air resource advisors is they're running blue sky models on this every day um, and getting, you know, tons, uh, tons of uh, emissions per day. It's been around 700 to 900 tons per day um, during, during the inversion. I haven't seen the latest numbers, but you know how much of that story gets told publicly is really interesting you know cuz cuz i i think it's this new dance that the teams are having with the public when they're putting intentional fire on the ground and they're not sure how much transparency is going to make them liable mhm yeah and it's made it kind of tough to cover on my end i haven't really wanted to um get out too far ahead of the team on their messaging on this and also, I was waiting kind of to see how it was going to unfold myself. And then uh, we had a couple of days where they couldn't fly um, for IR, and I had a couple of days where I was out of town. So it kind of worked out to have a little gap in our coverage here on, and let the kind of story catch up with the narrative, right? Like let let conditions on the ground kind of evolve before we start talking too much about what is actually happening. Uh, there's a lot of room for speculation looking at that firing plan map. Um, so it's, I feel like, well, now that they've finally done it, we can kind of, it's, the team has really begun to message now on their approach and why they're doing it. I think once you see, once you see these fires connected, you, it starts to make sense that, you know, you're boxing in this fire spread the south at the same time you're boxing in the potential for this fire to blow up and out and come down towards Orleans. What do you think, you know, as far as, us taking this kind of approach and beginning to apply it when we're not dealing with a bunch of lightning fires and resource shortages and everything else, you know, what's it going to take for us to see this kind of prescribed burning happening at this scale uh, without it all being started by lightning and being able to use kind of fire dollars and fire crews um, out of emergency funds? You know, big things like this happen when there's a shared vision from the local level all the way to Washington, D.C. And and just um, on the ground here, I know there's it's really highlighted some of the, you know, concerns in parts of our community. It's really polarized our community. Um, I've lost some friendships over supporting this strategic firing plan, you know, because um, people just don't like smoke and and they don't like humans to make smoke intentionally. You know, it damages their grapes, it damages their lungs. And, you know, that that argument that we're gonna get that smoke one way or another, you know, just isn't at this time enough to convince them that it's a good idea. So, and, and also, you know, people within the agency, you know, FMOs, um, you know, local fire resources are still a little bit uncertain about this plan too. You know, it's, it's something new. Um, but, you know, I, I think when you look at it through the, the, the reality that, you know, I mean, we did this, uh, 
analysis with you, Zeke, in 2014 and, and again in 2017 when we did the fire overlaps analysis for the 1.2 million acres of the Western Klamath Partnership. And at that time, roughly half, about 600,000 acres, hadn't seen fire in over 100 years. But the reality is since 2017, in the past five years, about 70% of that unburned area has burned in the Slater fire, the, the McCash fire, the river complex. And those fires have burned at uncharacteristically high severity rates for, for historic fires with really severe ecological and social impacts. You know, we're seeing rural flight as, as you know, the town of Happy Camp becomes a ghost town. There's no place to live. Half the town's burned down. And, and then we're seeing rivers that run mud all year long, you know. So uh, I think this is, you know, one of the few things we can control is, is when the fire comes back uh, on the wet years, right? It's, I mean, we can't control the drought years when fire is unstoppable, mm -hmm. but we can make that choice together. Um, and I think it's going to take some time for us to look at this example yeah. and see how it played out. I think so. I mean, I think one thing we've been covering from the get go is like here we've got your kind of <clears throat> landscape scale look of the Klamath and you see all the, the fire history and the bluer, the kind of green and blues are kind of last decade and a half. But we have been talking a lot about how you have this whole pocket in here of 150,000 acres that hadn't burned for 100 years and that how now we have really filled in a lot of that with of moderate severity burn fragmenting that that you know you still have a hundred thousand acre chunk right around orleans but you know i guess one th one, th one thought i had on this um oftentimes during these operations as it's been unfolding was um i hope we're not burning it not hot enough right i look at this landscape and i see all these clear cuts everywhere and i know that all these clear cuts are filled with kind of insane stocking levels yeah. and that um, we've got way too many trees out here. And that, so in some ways doing everything you can to minimize fire severity with your firing operations, isn't achieving the um, kind of silvicultural prescriptions we would really need to reduce the stems breaker. And so one where he's like, Oh man, putting two, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, get too deep into it and like i'm glad we're putting fire on this ground but i don't think that the solution to our longer term fuels issues is necessarily surface fire for the entire landscape that doesn't kill you know, half the trees i think that's a, that's a little it's tough to message that but i guess what are, i'm curious what your thoughts are about like okay it's it's great that we got a bunch of fire on the ground here um and we'll see once the smoke clears whether or not we you know significantly change the stocking I think it's a real win to get fire on this landscape, whether it's low or moderate severity. The, what we're seeing decadally is that that potential for high severity is shifting to the west towards the coast with the drying trend. So this, this landscape is in the gun sites of climate change and fuel accumulation. So having this, these fires in this landscape now saves those legacy trees for those those future fires so i'm i'm less and i and there there has been uh, some mixed severity in those in those areas um uh, from reports of folks that are doing those fire operations or are on crews mm -hmm. um you know i think it is a healthy mix of low and moderate severity now now that said you know we've we've all seen this fetishization of fire you know people you know, only doing prescribed burning once all the fuels are pretty much gone and you're burning this two inch layer of, of pine needles or whatever leaf litter on, on the ground. And it's not affecting the canopy, which is in some cases, the real problem, right? You know, these, this thicket of fir trees and tan oaks, the, the wetter site species that have invaded everything during the fire exclusion era, um, ecologically, we need to get rid of those in places. So what you're saying, though, in the bigger picture is just that we don't see a lot of large fire history here kind of between the um, Siskiyou Wilderness and the coast because it's been traditionally wetter and cooler 
and that with climate change, you're thinking that we're starting to see more fire pushing into that kind of fo- fog influenced coastal zone. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, the August complex was a good example of that. Um, I mean, you could even say the Smith river fires were this, this year were another example. Yeah. Um, it, it's coming. I mean, this, this, the modeling of the Slater fire was that if it wasn't for the 2018 Natchez and 2017 Oak fire footprints, just West of happy camp, that fire would have burned all the way to Crescent city in the first 24 hours. Oh man. All right. Well, what else you got on your, on your plate to talk about? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it will, once the smoke settles, I just check my rain gauge. I have 0. 0.05 inches of rain here. The storm has begun. And, and now the talk is pivoting to, uh, are we going to get landslides off of these fires or not? Um, and, and I think it brings up a real interesting, you know, conversation about, um, the, the difference between these real high severity fires and, and the more moderate severity fires, like we saw this year, you know, when you have fires that leave the roots of your resprouting plants, you don't lose all that soil into the river. Right. And so I think it's just another thing to think about is that, you know, people don't like smoke, but smoke is just carbon that's changed form. And so when we select for low and moderate severity fire, we're, minimizing the amount of smoke that we're going to have in the atmosphere year to year. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're minimizing the damage to our streams and, and holding on to our salmon runs. So, you know, we're having those dialogues and and I heard your comment, you know, Facebook is not the place to have arguments about strategy and tactics. Right. Um, But unfortunately it's kind of the dirty, the dirty tool that we do have. Right. Well, let's all move to YouTube. Well, here's your, uh, (laughs) there we go. Here's your, here's your rainstorm coming. Um, it looks like you guys are kind of on the Southern end. I'm, you know, I think the folks on the anvil, we've been talking a lot about anvil, just about, you know, it's this wilderness area that hasn't burned for a long, long time. And just that, yeah, it's rain. This is the, this is, here's, this is the global super tanker, right? Is, um, rain. This is the only global super tanker I need. All right, Will. I'm glad to have you on, man. I was thinking there's you know some podcasts I listen to, and these guys just like it's never shorter than like 90 minutes. You know, sometimes it's two and a half hours. It's like okay, I'm not sure if that's my style, but um, can always edit it later. It's Sunday. Good morning, brother. Thanks for having me, Zeke. Yeah, hope keep up the good work, and uh, now we can get a break. Huh? Yeah, I hope it rains an inch and you can sleep in. Yeah. Well, it's stoked to see what you guys are all doing over there. Stoked to see Vicky Preston's uh, pictures of you know all of her involvement, all the all the folks, um, all the tribal involvement. Uh, looking forward to you know I, I look on some of these maps and I see um, you know like a dotted line and a skull and crossbones that says like stay out of this property. I know there's some really good stories unfolding there that we'll be able to tell as this goes on. And uh, look forward to oh, yeah. talking about those with you. We tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, we were supposed to be starting the climate treks tomorrow. We postponed because we didn't want to add that 0.5% of smoke to the smoke shed, our one to four tons per day. <laughs> but we are uh, pivoting to October 30th. Um, so if you get a wild hair, come join us. October 30th. I can't think anywhere else. It's probably going to be a lot of pile burning. Oh, we got our own tracks going over here. I got to got to keep it local, but I appreciate that you guys kind of started this fire and we're spreading it. Yeah, brother. Well, thanks for spreading it. All right, well, catch you later, man. Yeah, have a good day. See ya.